Good morning, everyone. So delighted to see such a crowd after our silver bells yesterday. <laughs> My name is Reverend Emily Bruce. I'm the minister of this congregation. I want to invite you uh, all to be welcome here in this space as we have our worship together. Just a few announcements um, and one slightly longer announcement before we get started. First of all, does everyone have an ornament? Anyone not have an ornament? A wooden ornament that you were handed when you came in this morning. Okay, good. Just hold on to it. You'll be told what to do later. Um, this week and next, this Sunday and next Sunday, we're gathering mittens and hats and scarves for our mitten tree. So if you brought anything with you this morning, please go ahead, come up now and add it to our tree. Um, anywhere and everywhere you can find a space. And we're going to do the same thing next Sunday. And everything we collect is going to be taken down after worship next Sunday and given to Renewal House as part of our annual holiday offering to them. So um, mittens, scarves, gloves all ages, all genders, uh, new, please. And uh, please bring um, this week, well, today, which you aren't getting up because you don't have anything, but next week also. So, and there'll be reminders in the newsletter. Um, so Silver Bells was yesterday, yay! <laughs> um, I wanna offer, a, we're also doing it today from 12 to two. So if you didn't make it yesterday, come by today. There's lots of treats and goodies still to buy. Um, I wanna thank Carmen Gart and Deb Herlihy. Are they in here? They're probably home sleeping, but thank you to them. <laughs> for all their hard work, as well as everyone who baked, who cooked, who ran the kitchen, who counted the money. This was a full team effort. So thank you all, whoever participated in pulling off this success that was Silver Bells yesterday. Um, the Parsonage Holiday Party is gonna be happening on December 18th. That's two weeks from today at four o'clock in the Parsonage. You're all invited. We're gonna do potluck appetizers and desserts this year. Uh, emphasis on appetizers and desserts. So please don't bring a big pot of chili or something like that. It's going to be finger food only, but everyone's welcome to bring whatever they would like to bring. And that's December 18th at four o'clock. Um, family members are welcome. Spouses, significant others, all are welcome. Please come. It's our one time of the year to stuff the parsonage full of people, sing a bunch of carols, eat a bunch of yummy food and celebrate each other. So I hope you'll all come. And on December 21st, which is a Wednesday, we will be having our longest night winter solstice service here in the meeting house at 5.30 p.m. Again, that's Wednesday, December 21st at 5.30. And this is a service meant to provide a space of rest, quiet, and contemplation in the midst of what is for most of us a very busy and hectic holiday season. It's also a service that holds space for a lot of the grief that we carry around the holidays, the people we have lost who we miss. It often can feel very acute this time of year, remembering those who are no longer with us. And so that service is meant to hold a space for all of that. And everyone is welcome to join us for that. Uh, again, Wednesday, December 21st at 5.30 here in the meeting house. Finally, I'd like to invite up a member of our contract to call task force, who's got some words and announcements to share, Bob. So first off, Carmen and Deb just walked in. So everybody. All right. So all of you now are either really expectant or worried, you know, eagerly or what's he gonna do? No. Um, my name is Bob Lanson, and I am with the contract to call committee with Pauline Delar. Please stand up as you hear your name, Beth McAdams, uh, Linda Loring, Rosemary Donahue. You guys all stand up real quick and just You'll either thank them or curse them with me after we finish this process we're gonna be describing. But um, our purpose is gonna to be to supply information to the First Parish community on whether or not we should call Reverend Emily to be our settled minister. I know, I know to be honest, when they asked me to be in this committee, I'm like, oh, yeah, cakewalk. Yeah, who, who wouldn't want this wonderful person to be with us? Okay. I mean, it's not like it's that hard compared to like a sign-up genie. Like who can figure those out? I never, never do those. But, but as with everything with First Parish, things are a little more complicated than they might seem on the surface. So, uh, I mean, for example, now there's an exceptionally small possibility that someone we call might not want to, you know, lead this meandering herd of felines to some unknown destination. 
it could be a little bit of a challenge. So it is our job not only to ask her to come lead us, but to give her the critically important information of where we are going and more crucially, why. So if you could please turn to the back page of your order of service. And I'm gonna read the mission of this congregation and try not to look surprised. Yeah. We gather as a welcoming community to honor the sacred in all of life, to foster spiritual growth, nurture curiosity and learning, and build a just, compassionate, and sustainable world. So this is our mission. You know, and a lot of us might not have given thought to this since it was created exactly in what year, I don't remember. Um, but it is, it does speak to us. As you read it, you see yourself there. And what we want to do then is provide Reverend Embley with how does this statement speak to each of us? Okay. And with that, the committee got a little bit tougher. So over the month of January, we are going to be talking to each and every one of you uh, about what this mission statement means to you. And as you can see in the insert you have in your order of service, there is some dates that are listed there. Uh, those dates are small group sessions where you're going to be asked to come in and chat with your community members, small, small groups, uh, with some facilitators and about what the mission statement says to you. And from there, uh, we're going to be meeting as a group and then summarizing these ideas and presenting them to the governing board and Reverend Emily uh, for an eventual uh, contract to call vote that you'll have in the spring sometime. So you only need to attend one of these sessions, but it's critical that we hear from all of you. Uh, so critical that we'll be searching those out, those people out who didn't sign up <clears throat> uh, to hear your thoughts. Now, this is not just for membership to communicate here. If you're not a member, you're part of our community. We need to hear from you. And maybe this might be something that spurs you to, to sign the book and, and become a full member. Um, now, remember, if we call Reverend Emily to lead us, uh, we owe it to her to provide as detailed a map as we can where we, on where we need to go and how she can best assist us in getting there. And probably most importantly, what we need to do as individuals uh, together to bring our mission to life. And if you haven't looked at our website before, uh, as we were in our discussions here, we looked at the website and on the front page of the website, uh, it says, live your values aloud, not alone. And while we all have a variety of religious beliefs here, I think we all can agree on something that is absolutely sacred. And that is this community. Uh, this community, I think we understand that we can leverage our own values and affect both our community and the world around us in a more positive way because of that. So really look forward to you guys taking part in this. In your order of service, you have the little slip here on the back uh, where you just put your name, contact info, and then whichever of those small group sessions you can attend. There's three that are going to be small group sessions after service or on MLK Day. Uh, also, two remote sessions. We'll have a, a Zoom uh, a couple of those and, and we'll see if, if we need to do more we'll discuss as a group but we think this might meet, meet the needs and if you cannot make any of those please reach out to us because we will be reaching out to you all right thank you so much thank you bob yes you can clap it's okay i'm really grateful to bob and the entire team for taking on this very very important work and feeling very loved. And I think I'm going to change my business card to say minister to meandering felines. That is so on point, it's scary. All right, we have finally reached the end of our announcements section. So I invite you all to join me in taking a deep breath in and out. Get comfortable in your seat. If you're holding your phone, put it down, turn the ringer off, let it just sit there alone without you for the next hour. Take another deep breath in and out. And give yourself the gift of being present in this space with all of us for worship. I invite up Paula Fisher, who will lead us in our chalice lighting. Good morning, my name is Paula Fisher and I am the worship associate today and also the current chair of the music committee. And I welcome you all here. While our pieces may not always fit together neatly, it is within this sanctuary, guided by our principles that we gather together to create a beautiful mosaic. May the brokenness and beauty you find in one another create peace in this space and fill our hearts with love as we create worship together.
This morning, we light our chalice with these words by the Reverend Scott Taylor. Look, friends, to the sky, to the stars that dance like fireworks overhead, this tiny globe on which we travel. Look to the horizon, the tree line, the expanse of wide open fields to this living, breathing earth that makes our living and breathing possible. Look at the faces that surround you and notice what a wonder it is that we don't have to walk this world alone. All of it is a miracle. All of it deserves our awe. May this light we now kindle and this time we share illuminate the astonishing preciousness of it all. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, a time that historically the people of Christian faith celebrate as a time to prepare for and make room for the holy. For the holy. We honor Advent this morning by lighting candles and making space in our own hearts for something new to be born in each of us. For the first Sunday of Advent, which was last Sunday, we light the candle of hope. Today, the second Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of love. And we celebrate the universal love that is the spirit of this season. I invite you now to rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, number 226, People Look East. As we move into our time of sharing the joys and concerns on our hearts this morning, I invite you to sing side one of May Love Be Your Guide with me now. Will you join me in prayer? Spirit of life and love eternal, we offer our concerns and our sorrows in this sacred space this morning. We pray for grace, for healing, and for relief from suffering for ourselves 
and those beloveds that surround us. And we give thanks for the ever-present opportunities of joy and wonder, for moments of peace and goodwill among our fellow beings for this season of gratitude, for those we love, for our membership in this community of giving and receiving, of helping and guiding, we give thanks. Spirit of hope and resilience, we ask you to fortify the holy presence that we create together here today. In our broken and beautiful world, please help us to see the human in each other. Remind us of the resilience we possess the ability to hope for a better day, the faith in each other that carries us through when things are hard. We are all imperfect beings, doing our imperfect best to love each other. In this season of Advent, of waiting, of expectation, may we offer our hearts to each other, knowing that our love, while perhaps imperfect, is still love, and it is enough. May it be so. Amen. Let us now be still together. Please join me in singing side two of May Love Be Your Guide. This morning's reading, The Cultivation of Christmas Trees by T.S. Eliot. There are several attitudes towards Christmas, some of which we may disregard, the social, the torpid, the patently commercial, the rowdy, the pubs being open till midnight, and the childish, which is not that of a child for whom the candle is a star and the gilded angel spreading its wings at the summit of the tree is not only a decoration, but an angel. The child wonders at the Christmas tree. Let him continue in the spirit of wonder so that the glittering rapture, the amazement of the first remembered Christmas tree, so that the surprises delight in each new possession, each one with its peculiar and exciting smell the expectation of the goose or turkey and the awe of its appearance, so that the reverence and gaiety may not be forgotten in later experience, may not be forgotten in the bored habituation, the fatigue, the tedium, the awareness of death, the consciousness of failure. So that before the end, the 80th Christmas, by 80th meaning whichever is last, the accumulated memories of annual emotion may be concentrated into a great joy, which shall be also a great fear, as on the occasion when fear came upon every soul. Because the beginning shall remind us of the end and the first coming of the second coming. The child wonders at the Christmas tree. Let him continue in that spirit of wonder. When we give, we say yes to something we value. In this congregation, we take up an offering each week to say yes to the values of our UU faith 
and yes to this beloved community. Please give as you are able. Today's offering will be gratefully received. Our offering anthem is Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas by Hugh Martin and Ralph Lane. Thank you, choir. I know that's not like a hymn or a church song. It's a very, very commercial Christmas song, but it's lovely. And it has, talks about Christmas trees, which we're talking about today. So thank you, choir. Beautifully done, as always. So in a moment, um, we're going to be doing something with those ornaments you received when you walked in today. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about gratitude. I chose the homily title today, hashtag gratitude, somewhat cheekily, um, because it is definitely that hashtag gratitude time of year, right? Uh, if you go on social media at all, even a little bit, but especially on, if you're on Instagram, it feels like it's full of Christmas decorating posts and ribbons and candles and trees and cute dogs and matching family pajamas. And it's all tagged with hashtag gratitude, right? I saw one the other day. It's a picture of a perfectly decorated living room in this huge and beautiful house. And there was like wreaths and Christmas trees and a roaring fire and all this stuff. And the caption read, quote, 
scored major deals on all my holiday decorations this year and created the absolutely perfect winter wonderland. Hashtag gratitude. And now the room did look beautiful. Martha Stewart would have been proud. But scoring major deals and absolutely perfect? It's not really what this holiday season's about, right? 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 <laughs> okay. I really hope you agree with me on that point. But I will say, it's so easy for me to get sucked into that, right? And I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone, especially some of you master decorators in here. I know I'm not alone, but getting sucked into the perfect tree and the perfect holiday table and the perfect cookies, the endless seemingly drive to be perfect at the holidays, right? Anyone else with me? Anyone else worried about that? Yeah. Okay. I see you. I see you. Now I'll admit I'm planning on decorating the parsonage this week for the party. And I'm all excited about that tree and the mantles and all the candles and the twinkly lights. I'm definitely excited to do all those things, but you knew there was going to be a but. Hash, the hashtag gratitude kind of Christmas, ultimately, it ultimately only serves to distract me and all of us from what this season's really about. And, it, and what I want to focus on, and I will continue to focus on this month in our services, is the ancient stories that we still tell century after century at this time of year. Stories of hope coming into the world in the form of a humble form of a newborn refugee child. A tale of lamp oil that lasted for seven days, far longer than it should have. And even more ancient tales that celebrate the deep quiet and rest that the winter season invites us into. And the stories of the solstice that celebrate rebirth and the returning of the light. All of that perfection of hashtag gratitude really gets in the way of all of that for me. It distracts me for what, if I'm being honest, my soul really yearns for at this time of year, stories of faith and hope that our small selves with our small offerings are enough, that we don't have to be perfect to deserve love, that we are already fully loved, full stop. That's what the holidays are about for me. And this year I stumbled across a new to me story that really illuminated this idea. And especially given our beautiful tree, I wanted to tell this story today. So I actually stumbled across this in a news article I read this week. Um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi invited a fourth grader named Kachi Miko Tiger, who is a citizen of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, to participate in the Capitol Christmas lighting, the, the lighting of the Capitol Christmas tree. And so the article I read explained that, quote, Tiger won the role of youth tree lighter with an essay sharing the Cherokee origin story for evergreen trees. After creating all plants and animals, our creator asked them to fast, pray, and stay awake for seven nights. But at the end, only a few were still awake. And the trees that stayed awake were rewarded with the ability to keep their leaves all year long and with special healing powers. And it is a story of faith and gratitude and hope enduring through the dark night. That's the quote from the article. And so of course, that little snippet sent me diving into the Google to see if I could find out more about these Cherokee stories about evergreens. And on the website firstpeople.us, which hosts an enormous library of indigenous stories, legends and history by and for US and Canadian indigenous people, I found a story called Why the Trees Lose Their Leaves. This one's a little bit more in depth than the one in the article. It tells the story of Sparrow who broke his wing right before the migration season. So he couldn't fly south with the rest of his family. So he went from tree to tree, first the oak, then the maple and all these other trees asking if they would shelter him over the winter because he couldn't fly while his wing healed. And one by one, they all turned him away. They all said, no, I can't provide shelter for you. Go, go ask somebody else. So finally, with no other options, he approached the pine tree and the pine said, I, I'm the least of the trees. What can I, what could I do? My leaves are tiny. They're more like needles. And my branches are not as many as other trees, but 
The pine said, what I have, you are welcome to share. And so the sparrow nested there for the entire winter, held safe by the branches of the pine tree and his wing healed. And when Creator heard of Pine's humble offering to Sparrow, Creator first punished all the other trees by making them lose their leaves each year, but then rewarded Pine by making Pine's leaves evergreen. And while I don't like to think about the part of this story that entails all the other trees being jerks to the Sparrow, I love trees. I do love this story because it reminds me that our gifts, however humble they may seem to us, they can make such a difference when we offer them to other people. And I thought about that yesterday as I floated around Samson during the Silver Bells Fair. Some of you, more than some of you, many of you said things to me like, well, I just made this one little thing. I mean, look at all this stuff. I think I actually said that to somebody else at one point. But I want you to know that those gifts, however tiny they might feel to you, those simple offerings of what we are able to give is what gives life to real gratitude, not hashtag gratitude. And that's what the season's about for me. Extraordinary things can be born from humble beginnings. A refugee child was born in a barn while his parents were attempting to escape a cruel emperor. He grew up into, into a brown Palestinian Jew, a man I should note who would still live under threat of persecution if he were alive today. And we tell his story each year, over 2000 years later. That's an incredible thought on its own, but don't you think the innkeeper's simple offering of letting them sleep in his barn, not even in a room in the hotel, but the barn had an impact? Certainly did for him. And the story of Hanukkah as the lamp oil burned for eight straight nights is another example of a simple yet incredibly powerful miracle. And the lowly pine giving shelter to a broken bird, allowing him to survive the harsh winter when all others turned him away. All of these can help us remember that simple humble offerings can mean so much to those who receive them. So as we embark on this holiday season, I ask you, if you can, take time to step away from the hashtag gratitude Christmas that is no doubt going on all around you. Remember that this is not why we are still telling these humble stories so many years later about faith, about hope, and about light. Remember that each of you are a miracle to so many others. And that everything you offer, no matter how humble you might think it is, is a precious gift to everyone who receives it. And so, with that in mind, you were given an ornament when you came in this morning. Very simple and plain wooden ornament. And as you look at it, I want you to think about your gifts that you have to offer to those you love this season. We all devote time and energy to showing our love for all of those around us at this time of year. We give gifts, we bake cookies, we take long expensive trips to see those we love. These are all important and they make a real difference to the people who receive them. So in a moment, I will invite you to come up and decorate your ornament and hang them on the tree. But I don't want you to name what you're grateful for. I want you to name the gifts that you have to offer. It can be a word like love, attention, cookies, that's a good offering. It could be a picture like a heart or a roaring fire, or you could simply decorate your ornament, make it colorful and bright, whatever, whatever you feel called to do. But the focus is on what you have to offer. And you are going to decorate your ornament and we're gonna hang it on our tree, which will hold the collective wisdom and love of this beloved community throughout this entire season. So when you are ready, come on up. We've got markers, we've got colorful stickers. Um, if you prefer to stay in your seat and you want someone to bring you some markers, um, just raise your hand. Paula and I will walk around with some stuff so you don't have to come up if you don't like. And as we do this ritual, I want you all to just hold in your heart the simple message that you are enough, that you are a gift and everything you offer is welcome and blessed and holy. So please come forward when you feel ready. Thanks.
Thank you all for doing that. I know that was a little bit more labor intensive than our normal ritual, but look at our beautiful tree. Thank you, yay. As we bring this time of worship to a close, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to join us for hymn number 235, not 21, like it says in your order of service, but hymn number 235, Deck the Hall.